Good afternoon, everyone. To our friends and neighbors in our Muslim community, and by the way, we have the second largest Muslim community of any American state, Ramadan Mubarak. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, we wish you a, a blessed, holy, uh, and reflective month of Ramadan. Also, before we begin, I want to give everybody a huge thank you to all the folks who joined us last night for Jersey for Jersey. What a tremendous night to all the artists and Jersey icons who joined in, to every single one of you who watched and listened, to the heroes, healthcare workers, firefighters, first responders, small business owners who were highlighted, and everybody who was last night together sharing Jersey pride. I, and I can certainly say for the First Lady, can't thank you enough. Again, to the stars, to the heroes, bless you all. And by the way, it raised, the meter is still running, but it may, raised many millions of dollars for the Pandemic Relief Fund. And that money will be put to good use. As I've said from the very beginning, it will not be without casualty and we will have the sad task to update that uh, in a minute. That we're going to get through this as one New Jersey family. And last night that family came together as possibly never before. I'm honored to be joined by the woman on my right, who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. To her right, another person who needs no introduction, our state's epidemiologist, Dr. Christina Tan. Thank you, ladies. To my immediate left, another guy who needs no introduction, Superintendent of the State Police, Colonel Pat Callahan. We have Jared Maples, Director of the Office of Homeland Security and Preparedness with us. Uh, I know Matt Placken, Council, Chief Counsel, will join us in a bit. And joining us today on the far left, uh, a very, another good friend, Dr. Brian L. Strom, Chancellor of Rutgers Biomedical and Health Sciences. As we know, there are tremendous things happening at our state's flagship university, and I am proud to have Brian and his team as part of our army against COVID-19, and we'll get to all of that in a little bit. So, Brian, great to have you with us, man. First, as we have been doing of late up front, we will get to our daily uh, discussion uh, of the numbers, as sobering as they may be, and the charts that underpin them. We're announcing 4,427 positive test results, uh, pushing our state total to just under 100,000, 99,989. Uh, we should carry the expectation that tomorrow we will exceed 100,000 total positive cases. And remember, uh, I urge each of you to keep in mind that this is a cumulative number since our first positive case was announced only on March 4th. Of the nearly 100,000 total cases we have reported from then until today, roughly, we know 46,000 of these individuals have now exited the two-week incubation window. So even as we prepare for tomorrow, let's remember that there are tens of thousands of residents who have received a prior positive test result who have now likely defeated the virus. Sadly, however, we know that there are many who have not. And today we also report 307 additional deaths of precious souls and members of our New Jersey family, meaning that we have now lost a total of 5,368 blessed residents in New Jersey to COVID-19 related complications. We continue to see the, that the curve of new COVID-19 cases, as you see, remains significantly flat, even with today's slight uptick in cases. And as we map the outbreak across the state, we continue to see a slowing of the rate of spread. Mahan, let's go back to the chart before, though, if we could. Let's just remember one thing, and Judy and Christina can, can add to this. This is not the denominator. We wish we knew what the denominator was. These are more positive tests, probably specimens, Judy, taken five to seven days ago on average. Uh, thanks to Brian and team, it's a much more rapid return if you're in the Rutgers model, and it's a slower return perhaps in other models. But I don't want folks to confuse the fact that we've got more testing against, we're now the fourth highest tested state in America, uh, and we may be, frankly, getting close to the third highest tested state in America, considering where we started, 
uh, which was basically no, no re readiness or preparedness in, in our country, uh, that's quite a feat. But it still doesn't mean we know what the denominator is. This is just the amount of folks who have tested positive. And maybe if we could now flip to the chart that you were on, uh, and here we go. So the map, as we've seen this before, it measures the outbreak across the state, and we see a slowing of the rate of spread. And you can see this is a meaningful slowing. We changed our color code yesterday because we ran out of runway on light shades. But you've already seen a couple of counties go to over 30 days of doubling. This is the amount of time it takes to double the spread of the virus. Um, so that includes, by the way, my county of, of Monmouth. Look up at Bergen County, which is where this, where ground zero was, 29 days. So you're starting to see lengthening, and that's because of what you all are doing out there. Uh, I, I'm sure we're helping, but you're all doing the heavy work. You're the ones who are staying away from each other and abiding by social distancing. And because of that, that map shows us enormous progress and encouragement. Again, but at this point, and I, I'd like to think it's otherwise, but we can't ease up one bit on our social distancing. I am not and we're not in a position yet to begin reopening our state and jump-starting our economy. I still think that's weeks away. We need to see more progress and more slowing before we can begin those considerations. But stay at it because you are making a difference, unlike, by the way, in any American state right now, and that is another source of great Jersey pride. In our health care system, as of 10 p.m. last night, there are 7,000, as you can see, 240 residents hospitalized for COVID-19. That is, I think, virtually, Judy, unchanged from the night before. Our field medical stations have patients in total of 91 persons. And if you look at the rate of new hospitalizations, we see an uptick since yesterday, but still below our previous highs. There were 1,990 patients in either critical or intensive care, also virtually unchanged. Notably, ventilator use uh, had a considerable one-day drop to 1,462 currently in use. I think that's the lowest we've been since April 5th, uh, according to our notes. So Judy can give you some color on that. That's a good sign. And for the 24 hours preceding 10 p.m. last night, our hospitals reported 752 total discharges, also equal to new admittances. However, even as we know there are many who are defeating COVID-19, there are many whose battle with the invisible enemy was not successful. I'd like to remember a few of them if I can today. First up, Carolyn Martins writes there with her son, Thomas Martins. We've lost them both. You may have read about them, but today we want to honor them here. They lived in Kearney with Carolyn's husband and Thomas's stepfather, Rudy, with whom I had the honor of speaking this morning, and their daughter, Sharon, who was Thomas's half-sister. Sharon, by the way, is going through what a lot of seniors are going through, and that is facing the end of her college years and a virtual graduation, much to her consternation, as opposed to something physical and in person and celebrating together. Carolyn, bless her soul, a graphic artist who had worked for the Archdiocese of Newark, was the primary caregiver for Thomas, who has Down syndrome. Yet through Carolyn's love and hard work, Thomas was given every possible opportunity to thrive. COVID-19 took Carolyn away from her family at the end of March to her eternal rest at the age of just 55. And just over a little over a week later, it also took Thomas uh, just as he was turning 30 years old. Rudy called Carolyn, and I'll quote Rudy, her husband, one of the smartest, kindness, kindest, gentlest people, and these traits are what helped her give Thomas such a tremendous life too. And Thomas is remembered fondly by so many. We are keeping them, both Carolyn and Thomas, God rest their souls, as well as Rudy and Sharon and their whole family and community in our prayers. Gut heartbreaking right there. Dave Clark, there he is 
was a firefighter with the Bayhead Fire Company, where he filled any role that needed to be filled from chief engineer, looking after the mechanical performance of the company's vehicles, to safety officer. He was a truck driver professionally and took a special interest in following the changes being made in fire truck and emergency equipment designs and builds. He was just 47 years old. And by the way, not just Dave, but his family. This family believes in service to the Bayhead community. Dave's wife, Lisa, who's with him there and with whom I just had the honor of speaking, serves with the Bayhead Fire Police. And son, Zach, is a probationary firefighter and is set to become a full firefighter this month. And I know Dad is looking down with pride. Dave also leaves behind his daughter, and I had a quick word with her as well, bless her, Michaela. They had lost one of its bravest. To Dave, we thank you for your service, and to the entire Clark family, we are with you in prayer and mourning. God bless you all. Pat will know this guy, Rick Vanderklok, 71 years old of Wayne. Rabbi Kirshner, uh, by the way, of uh, Temple Emmanuel, uh, raised this with me uh, yesterday. Rick grew up, look at that guy, man. Talk about the prototypical New Jersey State Trooper, huh? Looks like he's cut out of granite. Rick grew up in Midland Park in Bergen County and was a member of the 85th class of the New Jersey Police Academy in 1971. He was a trooper for 29 years. He leaves behind his wife of 46 years, Maureen, with whom I had the great honor of speaking. His sons, Rick, who I also spoke with. By the way, Rick tested positive and has got his first day back with the Wayne PD tomorrow. His other son, David, who I have not yet spoken with but tried, he retired recently from the West Caldwell Police Department. And by the way, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. I mentioned that Rick senior grew up in Midland Park and I believe it's accurate to say that his dad was the police chief in Midland Park so you talk about a you talk about a law enforcement families but God bless Maureen Rick David and their families including Rick's grandchildren Julia Jason Ava and Jake along with his brother Robert and sister Joy and their families may Rick's memory bring bring them comfort at this difficult time and may they also bring them happiness in the times to come. God bless them all, and God bless you, Rick. Three, four, in fact, more lives among a total of 5,368, which are all worth remembering, and believe me, all of us would like to speak to each and every one of those, and maybe at some point down the road, when the dust settles on this awful thing, we'll be able to do that. To every family who's lost, lost a loved one, our entire state, stands with you in support as the great and diverse family we are. Now moving forward. Today with Brian here, I am pleased to announce that because of the new saliva-based training which Rutgers University has developed, next week we will begin testing all residents and staff at each of our five state developmental centers. This is a total of more than 5,500 tests more than 1,200 residents, and in excess of 4,300 members of staff. These are among our most vulnerable residents, and the women and men who provide care for them daily are among our most essential workers. They are dedicated employees who are showing up 24-7 to help care for the adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities who call, by the way, our centers their home. These doctors, nurses, direct care staff, food service providers, housekeeping staff, and many others are doing an extraordinary job and are making a difference in the lives of so many who have no other place to turn, by the way. And our residents, many of whom have called these centers home, literally, Judy, for decades, have faced many challenges in this difficult time, including not being able to visit with family or enjoy their regular outings in the community. Sadly, we have seen this virus in all of our centers, and we owe our residents and staff our best, and testing will help us best serve them. And we are working to expand testing to other state workers and the individuals we serve. 
These tests would not have been as quickly administered if not for the testing system created by Brian's team at Rutgers University. And it should be noted, this testing system is already going into wide use by our state's largest healthcare systems at the PBA sponsored first responding responder test sites and soon at many other places statewide. And as I have noted many times, having a robust and greatly expanded testing program in place is vital to our being able to begin to reopen responsibly our state. I said on a Monday, I still believe it today on Thursday, that we need to at least roughly double our testing capacity as a minimal benchmark. Testing will be the starting point, and Judy and Christina have forgotten more about this than I'll ever know, for any contact tracing program that we'll be able to implement, whether it be narrow and localized within our communities or broad-based in partnership with our neighboring states. Without testing, we will not be able to take the necessary steps to contain future cases and prevent them from becoming boomerang outbreaks. Remember again, sufficient, scaled, and rapid return testing, contact tracing, and then a plan for isolation and or quarantining. Those are the essential elements of the healthcare infrastructure that we're going to need before you have the confidence, and we could tell you that we've got the confidence to begin to reopen our state. And we're working as fast as we can, by the way, and all the above. So having an FDA-approved test that can provide us rapid results is critical. And through their saliva-based test system, Rutgers University is in position to help us get there. Moreover, this is a tremendous point of Jersey pride for us all. Our state, after all, is the historic home of innovations, especially in the life sciences. And now we have a huge breakthrough coming from our very own flagship university. To be clear, Rutgers is an invaluable partner among so many in the expansion of testing statewide, and so much is being made possible because of this. And I look forward to this continued partnership. I know Brian will have more to say about this testing system after Judy's remarks, along with other advances being made on the banks of the old Raritan. But right now, to you and all at Rutgers, Brian, I say both thank you, and I look forward to the cooperation to come. And speaking of testing more generally, there are now 86 sites across the state providing COVID-19 testing, including some that are utilizing Rutgers tests. A complete list of the publicly run and community-based sites can be found on our information portal at covid19 covid19 rather nj.gov slash testing and should you believe you need to be tested your primary care practitioner can direct you to one of the privately run testing sites nearest to you switching gears this morning the department of labor reported that an additional 140,000 new jerseyans filed for unemployment last week and that one billion dollars in unemployment benefits have now been distributed since this emergency began a little more than a month ago. Since March 15th, more than 858,000 New Jerseyans have filed for unemployment benefits. Just to put that in context, folks, one year ago that total number collecting unemployment was less than 10 percent of that, 84,000. 84,000 a year ago, 858,000 today. The department continues to do everything it can to streamline processes and ensure that all claims are handled quickly. For those of you trying to connect on the phone, we thank you for your continued patience. The department is still dealing with volumes that are, minimally stated, unprecedented. We urge you to go to our online hub, again, at covid19.nj.gov and search unemployment for answers and additional links to many of your questions regarding things like eligibility, benefits for self-employed workers, how to claim your weekly benefits, and much more. Regardless of when your claim is accepted, I've said this before and I want to repeat it again today, no one will be denied one penny of the benefit they deserve. And by the way, if you have lost your job and you can still work, please visit the jobs portal available through covid19.nj.gov, the information hub, 
which is currently listing more than 66,000 jobs for more than 740 essential employers across the state and across an array of industries. And a reminder that anyone who has left their job voluntarily or who refuses to work at their currently available job is not available, not eligible rather, for unemployment. Now as we do every day, I'd like to acknowledge some of the really good things going on around our state. Whether it be from our corporate citizens or just everyday New Jerseyans, the outpouring of community spirit and support has been critical to sustaining us through this emergency. One of our state's iconic businesses, AT&T and the AT&T Foundation, have partnered with the New Jersey Restaurant and Hospitality Association to provide meals from local restaurants to the healthcare professionals and support staff at our field medical stations in Secaucus and Edison. AT&T has also stepped forward with critical financial support for the United Way of Essex and West Hudson so they can provide for those in our communities who need a helping hand. So to AT&T and the AT&T Foundation, New Jersey thanks you. I want to also give a shout out to New Jersey-based Premium Nature, and in particular to Shulam Iskowitz and Aaron Stefanski who came through with a donation of 500 gallons of hand sanitizer to the New Jersey Office of Emergency Management, Pat. This product will soon find its way out of our warehouse into the front lines of our fight against COVID-19. Our dear friend and colleague, second from the left, State Police Chaplain Rabbi Abe Friedman, God bless you, Abe, was there at Div Division Headquarters in Trenton, and he was joined by your new chief, Chaplain, Reverend John Taylor of Trenton right here, and state police personnel to accept this donation and to give premium nature our thanks. And now from me and the Colonel, New Jersey, thanks you. And by the way, I'm very gratified to see social distancing going on in that picture, Judy. And once again, to everyone who joined us for Jersey for Jersey last night, the stars, the first line responders, heroes, the healthcare worker heroes, to the small businesses who, who were profiled, and community leaders, also heroes, and everybody who played a part in that, as well as the Jersey takeover on HQ Trivia, thank you. Finally, before I turn things over to Judy, I want to return to something that I said yesterday. I spoke about Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell's views on state bankruptcy. I used some strong language which was richly deserved, by the way, but that's because I know how dire the situation is. I have been clear for weeks that if we do not get significant, direct, and flexible financial support from the federal government, we will be forced to make many difficult decisions about programs we all rely upon and which we will lean on in the months ahead. And I know that doesn't just go for New Jersey. It also goes for many of our sister states, red and blue alike. Unfortunately, if it wasn't bad enough yesterday when uh, Senator McConnell was talking about bankruptcies, and by the way, Senator, if you are watching, remember you are from the party of Abraham Lincoln, of Theodore Roosevelt, and Ronald Reagan, three American presidents who, when faced with challenges, found ways to meet those challenges to be greater than the challenges, to rise up. This isn't about partisanship. This is about America and doing what's right and our values, not just here in New Jersey, but across our country. And looking to history to find role models. What better role model than Abraham Lincoln? What better, who freed the slaves, who kept our country together in civil war? Or Theodore Roosevelt, uh, the environmentalists around this country to this day look to him for leadership or George H.W. Bush, the guy who presided this country when the Berlin Wall fell. Those were leaders who met the moment, who got big. They did not get small. They got big in that moment. And that is the challenge, Senator, to you and to all leaders in this country, to find your bigness, to find this moment in time as a chance to stand up and to meet history head on and to do the right thing. 
So if it was bad enough yesterday talking about bankruptcies, unfortunately we received some additional bad news when the U.S. Treasury Department issued its guidance for how we can use the billions of dollars in funding provided to the state and many of our counties in the CARES Act, which was signed uh, several weeks ago. I have been clear that even this funding, while deeply appreciated, is woefully insufficient to address the scale of the revenue loss that we are experiencing due to our mitigation efforts. Efforts which are working, by the way, and are saving lives. I was assured that this funding would be able to be used flexibly by states, filling holes that we now must deal with. Those assurances apparently were empty. Treasury's guidance renders much of this funding literally unusable and without additional flexibility will mean that we will likely not only not be able to use it, but we'll have to return a good chunk of it to the federal government. Let me explain in case you're wondering what this means. Unlike the federal government, we can't print money, by the way. The federal government can also run trillion-dollar deficits every single year. New Jersey can't. I, by the way, just like New Jersey's families, I might add, have to budget based on certain income and certain expenses. And for the past two years, we have done something unique for New Jersey. We actually put some money away for a rainy day. When we close our economy, as we have had to do to crack the back of this virus and to slow its spread and to save lives, that income goes away. If the federal government doesn't do its job and support New Jersey's families, we may not be able to keep our teachers, cops, firefighters, and paramedics employed. The very people who are on the front lines every day. And we'll have to send this money back to Washington. Sadly, the message from Washington to our first responders and to our educators and to others on the front lines is clear. As you work tirelessly to stop this pandemic, to keep people safe, our national leadership thinks you are not essential and in fact that you should fear for your jobs. And again, I was reminded by someone yesterday, whenever anything goes into bankruptcy or there's a financial catastrophe, the people who pay the biggest price are our seniors. Think about that for, as well. So again, clear, $1.8 billion from the CARES Act several re weeks ago, we're happy for it, but it was never enough to begin with. But at the very least, we should be able to support our people and help keep the funding that municipalities and school districts are expecting to stay whole. I and my staff have already reached out to Senate Democratic Leader Chuck Schumer's office. I spoke with Speaker Pelosi last night. We've been on with their respective staffs. We will not relent until the federal government provides the support we need to protect the services that millions of residents rely upon. And remember this, I and we will never Stop fighting for you. We will fight this to the death. With that, please help me welcome the woman who needs no introduction, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, Judy Persichelli. Thank you, Governor, and good afternoon. Epidemiologists and chronic disease experts tells us, tell us that those with underlying conditions, such as obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure, are at greater risk for more serious complications and deaths uh, from diseases like the flu, and New Jersey mirrors uh, national statistics on this issue. A recent study of New York City patients with COVID-19 that was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association provides further evidence of this elevated risk. The study examined 5,700 patients hospitalized with COVID-19 in New York. The most common comorbidities among these individuals were hypertension, 56.6%, obesity, 41.7%, and diabetes, 33.8%. Of the patients who died, those with diabetes were more likely to have received invasive mechanical ventilation or care in the ICU compared to those who do not have diabetes. Of our COVID-19 deaths, the breakdown of underlying conditions is as follows. Heart disease, 60%. 42% had diabetes. 
20% had chronic lung disease, such as asthma, emphysema, chronic obstructive lung disease, 16% chronic renal disease, 15% neurological disability, 11% had cancer, and 31% had other chronic diseases. Given this greater risk of severe illness and death, the Department of Health is recommending that all individuals who have even mild symptoms that could be associated with COVID-19, such as fever, cough, tightening in the chest, call your doctor and get tested, especially if you have underlying conditions. Today we report 7,240 hospitalizations last night, basically flat uh, over the last two days. There are 1,990 individuals in critical care, uh, of which 73% are on ventilators, which is much lower uh, than we have seen previously. I know there's a request for hospital discharge data by location. We are still uh, looking into that. And as soon as we can get that from the discharge data set, we will share that with you. Today we are reporting 4,247 new cases uh, for a total of 99,989 positive cases in the state. And sadly, 307 new deaths have been reported to the department. The breakdown of deaths by race and ethnicity is as follows. White, non-Hispanic, 53.6%. Black, non-Hispanic, 20%. Hispanic, 16%. Asian, non-Hispanic, 5.4%. And other, non-Hispanic, 5%. Today, the veteran homes are reporting five additional deaths associated with COVID-19. We also are receiving reconciled data from our long-term care facilities. And we are also starting to look at death certificates to reconcile individuals who have died with a primary diagnosis of COVID-19 and or a secondary diagnosis associated with COVID-19. We do expect that you will see on our dashboard an increase in the number of deaths because we are including probable mortalities from COVID-19. As you know, across uh, many other states and certainly in New Jersey, uh, our long-term care facilities are reporting cases and deaths. There are 446 long-term care facilities in the state right now uh, that are reporting COVID-19 cases for a total of 13,769 cases. In collaboration with Cooper University uh, Health System, uh, we started yesterday testing 3,000 long-term care residents and staff at 16 long-term care facilities in the southern part of the state. Our goal is to contain the spread of COVID-19 among the, these facilities in the southern part of the state that is not experiencing as many cases compared to the northern regions and where we see a possibility to actually decrease the spread and save lives. In terms of lab reports, according to the data from this morning of seven labs uh, sending us COVID-19 results, 107, uh, 179,717 uh, individuals were tested, 79,558 are reported as positive for a positivity rate of 44.27%. So I want to mention our call uh, center again for individuals looking for COVID-19 information. As you know, the state, working along with New Jersey Poison uh, Information Center, established a dedicated coronavirus hotline in January reachable at 1-800-962-1253. Since that time, trained health professionals have taken more than 25,000 calls. Additionally, NJ211 has answered more than 15,000 calls from residents seeking general information. These continue to be excellent resources for information on the virus and the state's response. As always, I thank you for staying home and maintaining social distancing, stay connected, stay safe, and stay healthy. Thank you. Judy, thank you for that um, update and for everything. Um,
counties, just briefly, the, the same six counties continue to be the leading uh, locations for positive results, and that's in order Bergen, Hudson, Essex, Union, Passaic, and Middlesex, and that's the six that we've had. But remind everybody, every one of our 21 counties has both positives and, sadly, fatalities. So this is a... Uh, this is a statewide all-hands moment. Thank you, Judy.